This is Ling270, Language, Technology, and Society. In this video, we continue with our current module on modern language technologies. Having previously gone over speech technologies, we are now going to focus on technologies for text processing. The majority of the time in this module will be spent focusing on machine translation. As we discuss machine translation, hopefully we will go through, incidentally, several other language processing technologies. We're going to begin our examination of machine translation with the document that is widely accepted as having kicked off the modern age of machine translation research. After going through this initial document, Warren Weaver's translation memorandum, we will go through the remainder of machine translation research in the 20th century at a very high level. What you see here is the opening page of Warren Weaver's translation memorandum, written in the late 1940s. At this point in history, computers were still in their infancy. And yet, even as very few computers were available and computers were just starting to be used, people imagined that these new devices for computing could potentially be used to translate one human language into another. Warren Weaver was a scientist and mathematician who worked for the Rockefeller Foundation. He was responsible, in part, for handing out and managing grants from the Rockefeller Foundation to various scientific and humanitarian enterprises. Let's go through Warren Weaver's translation memorandum. This was a document inspired by some earlier written communication, some letters between Warren Weaver and some colleagues, that then developed into this thought experiment. Can computers be used to translate human language? And if so, what options might we have for doing so? This document was distributed to a variety of people in Warren Weaver's academic and social networks. This document kicked off modern machine translation research. Let's begin. Weaver writes, the attached memorandum on translating from one language to another on the possibility of contributing to this process by the use of modern computing devices of very high speed etc. Weaver writes, I've worried a good deal about the probable naivety of the ideas here presented, but the subject seems to me so important that I'm willing to expose my ignorance, hoping that it will be slightly shielded by my intentions. That is indeed how it turned out. This document can also be downloaded online if you want to follow along. Warren Weaver begins with a war anecdote about decoding during World War II. Weaver is somewhat aware of the fact that computers were used to crack codes during World War II. The exact details of this would have been classified, but Weaver may have gotten some information about the general ideas from colleagues, possibly including Alan Turing. In this war anecdote, Warren Weaver describes a situation where an encoded message is decoded without the user knowing 
what the original code or message was through the use of a computer. The original message turns out to have been in Turkish. Weaver takes this and thinks, could the analogy of decoding, where there's a cipher and the message is encoded in some way, be utilized successfully for translation? So could the process of translation be viewed as a process of a message being encoded in one language and then decoded from that language back to the original? Weaver, present, Weaver proposes that this idea could even go so far as to be practically used. So Weaver says, imagine that, you're, that someone is speaking Russian. I will think to myself, this person is really thinking in English, despite the fact that they're speaking in Russian. And there's a process by which their speech, as it goes from their brain to their vocal apparatus, encodes the message, that is, garbles it in some way so that what they come out speaking is different from what they had originally envisioned. Now, clearly this isn't what people do, but Weaver thought this an interesting way of posing the problem of translation. In this way, you could envision the speech process as encoding the message in the foreign language, Russian, and then the listener decoding the message from Russian back into English. Weaver notes that translation is necessarily a difficult problem, in large part because of the problems of ambiguity. Here, Weaver discusses the fact that words in English and words in other languages can have multiple meanings. For example, the word bank can have multiple meanings. It could refer to a building where you keep your money. It could refer to the side of a river, or it could refer to an aircraft. I'm not going to draw an airplane. My uh, skills aren't that good. Banking in midair. So if one were translating from, say, English into French, and one encountered the word bank in the English sentence, you would need to disambiguate this ambiguity, determine which sense of the word bank is being used in this particular context. So, ambiguity is one of the primary challenges of translation, and that continues into machine translation, and there's many levels of ambiguity. So let's switch back to Weaver's memorandum and see what else he thinks of. So here Weaver talks about using auxiliary lookups. So having some sort of a grammatical annex to find uh, that there are morphological variants of a particular word. This is a really good point, and it, many systems uh, to, over the decades have failed to do this, looked into morphology. So let's take an aside for a moment and ask what is morphology? So morphology is the study of how the parts of words combine to form words. So in this example, we have the word run, and eventually 
the ing gets added and English spelling dictates that we have this additional n. So if we take the word running and break it down into its component parts, run plus ing, this is an NLP task, a natural language processing task involving morphology called morphological analysis. So, in addition to machine translation, this is the first additional NLP task that we've identified, morphological analysis. And when we're translating English, uh, morphological analysis is helpful, but not necessarily necessary. When we're dealing with languages that have much more complex morphology, such as agglutinative languages, including Turkish or Finnish, or polysynthetic languages, such as uh, Inuktitut, this becomes much, much more important. So Weaver recognizes that a mechanical dictionary is necessary so that at a minimum, you can do a word-for-word -word translation. But he recognizes that word-for-word -word translation isn't going to cut it most of the time. So he gives an example of the 23rd Psalm from the Hebrew Bible and uh, gives an example of that this would not translate well uh, word for word. So this gets us to meaning and context. So Weaver posits that ambiguity can be in some ways mitigated through the use of context within the sentence. So he gives the example of the word fast, that it might mean going quickly, as in rapid, or it might mean motionless, as in holding fast means not moving. So let's go back to our bank example. So if we encounter the word bank, how do we know whether we're referring to uh, a, a money institution, a river, or an airplane banking in midair? Well, the idea here is that one can use context. So let's take a look. Bank fees were... So let's say we encountered this, this fragment of a sentence. The bank fees were part of a longer sentence that might be the bank fees were considered reasonable or the bank fees were exorbitant. So if we want to disambiguate the word bank, here we have another NLP task called word sense disambiguation. Word sense disambiguation. And the goal of word sense disambiguation is to take a word and identify which sense of the word is intended in this particular example. So do we mean a financial institution? Do we mean a river? Do we mean an airplane in midair? And Weaver says, well, what if we look at the word, look at a window? perhaps before, one word before, perhaps one word after. How large of a window is it necessary to use in order to successfully disambiguate? In this case, a window of size one would suffice. So if we see bank immediately followed by fees, there's a very high chance that we mean financial institution. 
so that it's the financial sense of the word bank. And I encourage you to try this example at home. So find, a, find some text and go through the text and identify words that you think have more than one meaning. Then I would encourage you to use a, a piece of paper as to make a window or your fingers and slide this window along and try to figure out how large of a window do you need on average to, in order to correctly disambiguate a word that has multiple senses, multiple meanings. And you'll find that in some cases the window required is pretty short in some cases, the window is longer. So here's our second task. We've got morphological analysis. We've got uh, word sense disambiguation. And these are both issues that will come up in the larger task of performing machine translation. Weaver also is aware in section six that language can have mathematical properties, or rather, language can be manipulated through the use of mathematical models. The model that he's aware of was some preliminary work by, from 1943 by McCulloch and Pitts, who were instrumental in the initial development of the theory behind neural networks. Neural networks went through some ups and downs over the course of the 20th century. Uh, but in general, their use was relatively limited in many ways because of the lack of sufficiently fast hardware. However, in recent years, since about 2010, many, many natural language processing tasks have successfully utilized neural networks as models for doing their processing. So neural networks or artificial neural networks are mathematical models that are roughly inspired by the connections within the human brain. Now, neural networks are not an NLP task, but neural networks are used in many NLP tasks, including machine translation, or MT. So in the late 1940s, Warren Weaver correctly foresaw that neural networks could potentially be utilized. We already talked about the cryptography analogy. Uh, let's see. This is the last big idea that we'll talk about in Warren Weaver's message. So the idea of an interlingua. So let's actually read some of what Weaver suggests. Indeed, what seems to WW, that's Warren Weaver, interestingly writing in the third person, to be the most promising approach of all is an approach that goes so deeply into the structure of languages as to come down to a level where they exhibit common traits. Think by analogy of individuals living in a series of tall closed towers, all erected over a common foundation. When the people in these towers try to communicate with one another, they shout back and forth, each from his own closed tower. It is difficult to make the sound penetrate even the nearest towers, and communication proceeds very poorly indeed. But when an individual goes down his tower, he finds himself in a great open basement 
common to all the towers. Here he establishes easy and useful communication with the persons who have also descended from their tower. So Weaver is proposing here that there is a common core to all human languages and that perhaps models for translation could be made whereby the translation methodology begins at the source language and decomposes the source sentence into some language independent representation. And then from that language independent representation generates the target language representation. So the idea here is that we've got our tower over here in which people are spe speaking French. And we've got another tower over here where people are speaking Swahili. And if a person wants to communicate, they could shout French and the other person could listen, but it's unlikely that they're going to get the message. So instead, what we can do is have the person descend to the interlingual basement where at this point they're speaking a common uh, in, in a way that's common to all languages. Now, this is where the analogy sort of breaks down because there is no real language independent speech mechanism, although many people over many centuries have tried to develop one. But the idea is that this is a common interlingual space. And that if two people descend from their towers, that at this level, communication is easier. All right. That's all for this first lecture. Uh, in this lecture, we went through, at a very high level, some of the ideas that Warren Weaver, a program director at the Rockefeller Foundation, presented to his colleagues in 1949. In doing so, we discussed multiple issues, including ambiguity, recognizing that language contains ambiguity in many different places and in many different ways. If one wants to successfully translate using computers, one has to deal with ambiguity in some way. It's also important to recognize that language involves morphology. So morphology is the aspect and study in linguistics of word components such as run and ing coming together to form larger units, which we call words. Decomposing a word into its component morphemes is a separate and important NLP task relevant to morphology, the study of these parts and how they combine. This task is called morphological analysis. Another NLP task that we discussed in the context of disambiguating ambiguity in language is word sense disambiguation. So word sense disambiguation is the task of taking a word in a text, 
that has multiple potential senses, multiple potential meanings, and attempting to determine which of those senses is the most relevant in this particular instance. We also discussed artificial neural networks. Artificial neural networks are not an NLP task, but in recent years have become very popular and very successfully utilized in a large number of NLP tasks, including machine translation. And finally, we looked very briefly at the idea of an interlingua, or a common language space, through the idea of Warren Weaver's towers, where someone who speaks, for example, French, could, instead of shouting across the vast distance between their language and someone else's language, descend into a, a hypothetical and, frankly, imaginary uh, interlingual space wherein it would be easier to communicate. We'll look at this in more detail later. Thank you for, for watching, and we'll continue with our next lecture.